Welcome to Life Transformation Radio. This show is all about life transformations and our journey from where we were to why we are doing what we are doing today. We will discuss the hiccups, the roller coasters, and the blood, sweat, and tears that has been poured out while discovering our purpose. It is all about our transformation. Here is your host, Sean Douglas. Good afternoon and good evening, and welcome to another episode of Life Transformation Radio. I am your host, Master Resilience Implementer, TEDx Speaker, Business Positioning Strategist, and Author, Sean Douglas. This show is currently heard in over 70 countries, such as the United States, Canada, United Kingdom, all across Europe and Asia. So I want to thank you to those who are listening from around the world. Life Transformation Radio is all about our transformation. Here is where we tell the stories of why we're doing what we're doing. We highlight that transformational moment that changed our lives and how we use this to then transform others and elevate their lives as well. You can listen to us live right here on the Blog Talk Radio Network Tuesday through Friday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. You can join our Facebook community, Life Transformation Radio Community, and never miss an episode of the show. You can also subscribe wherever you're comfortable listening to podcasts. We are on iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, TuneIn, Player FM, Radio Public, Overcast, um, CastBox, the Google Play Music app, the Himalaya app. So wherever you're comfortable listening to podcasts, I ask that you please subscribe to our show, Life Transformation Radio. On the show, I bring on entrepreneurs, speakers, business owners, podcasters, authors, basically amazing people who are impacting the world around them. And my guest today does exactly that. If you have any questions for any of the guests that I bring on the show during our live broadcast, you can call us up at 657 383 1109. Again, the number is 657 383 1109. And with that, Please help me welcome to the show, my guests, Andy Kramer and Al Harris. Welcome to Life Transformation Radio. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. I am super pumped to have you both on the show. One, because I don't usually do like the double guest. So I always, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have like more than just me and that one person. So it always adds a great dynamic. But moreover, when I have amazing people like the couples like on the show, it, it just turns out to be just an amazing, amazing episode. Secondly, I've never touched this topic before. I've, out of 230 some odd episodes, I've never had the, the specific topic that we're going to talk about in depth. I haven't had this on the show. So I'm very excited to see where this goes. Well, we are as well. Ready for the ride. <laughs> Perfect. So the title of the episode is Communication Techniques for Working Women with Andy Kramer and Al Harris. Andy Kramer and Al Harris are married practicing lawyers. They have been mentoring women and speaking and writing about gender communication for more than 30 years. Andy and Al offer women unique, balanced, and highly practical advice they can use to prevent gender biases from slowing or derailing their careers. Andy and Al also present arresting information and compelling examples for male audiences to make them aware of and sensitive to the gender biases that hold women back, even in the most well-intentioned organizations. This power couple provides organizations, business and professional, with concrete, non-disruptive suggestions for workplace changes that will make women's career opportunities more comparable to men's. Authors of the popular book, Breaking Through Bias, Communication Techniques for Women to Succeed at Work, Andy and Al are frequent keynote speakers and conduct workshops for multinational organizations to better understand the world of gender bias. You can go to their website, Andy and Al. Andy is A-N-D-I-E, and then A-N-D-A-L, so Andy and Al, dot com. Their Facebook is Breaking Through Bias, and their LinkedIn, everything's in the show notes. Click the links in the show notes and connect with them. They're doing absolute, absolute amazing work. So Andy, I want to start with you and then Al, same question. I want to know what your deep why is for what you do. Why do you do what you do? Well, 
not to make it a long story, because it's only fair that everybody should have the same opportunities to succeed in the workplace and that it should not be based on anything other than talent, commitment, and willingness to work hard. I agree. I agree. I actually looked up something earlier in in preparation for the show because literally I don't know. I've spent the last almost 20 years in the military, and then I've been an entrepreneur building businesses, you know, throughout. And I didn't actually know this, but there is a high percentage, like more than I really thought. I was like, nah, it's not that bad. No, it is. There's a high percentage, like the like the gap, right, for like gender pay and like everything else. Um, Absolutely. In the, in the like in the work, I was like, wait a minute, nah, no way. And so, um, but there is, and there's studies that have been done on this. And so, there's a big gender gap, okay, and there's it, it's upwards of. 20%. So for every dollar a man makes in the workforce, a woman will only make 80 cents, 80, about 80 and a half cents, 81 cents, 80 to 81 cents. So for every dollar the man makes, women are only making 80 to 81 cents. That's crazy. That's right. But I don't think that that pay disparity even captures just how bad it is because in virtually all business areas, professions, academia, politics, mm-hmm. Women are entering at we're at entry levels at the same rate that men are, but each mm-hmm. step up career ladder, women drop off. So that by the time, and let's just take business, by the time you get to uh, management uh, managers, women are only about 30%. By the time you get to senior managers, they're only about 20%. By the time you wow. get to C-suites, they're only about 10%. And by the time you right. get to the CEO, they're less than 5%. That's crazy. And it's the same way in speakers. If you, if you notice, because we're all speakers here, if you notice, there's a lot more men speakers than there are women speakers. And there's a lot more men getting booked for events than there are women. I do notice that. No question. And I know a lot of women are like, where's the women speakers? Like, come on already. You know, and they want, you know, the women to step up. And um, and I love seeing, I love speaking on stage with, with um, you know, the female speaker. It just, I think it adds an amazing dynamic. That's why when I, when I get like the power couples, I'm like, oh, this is going to be awesome. Because you get both sides, you know. I only see one side because I'm on one side, you know. My wife's a stay-at-home mom. Um, when we had our last kid, she didn't, you know, she she hasn't worked and, you know, so I only see one side of everything that's happening. So, Well, one of the interesting things that you said is that, you know, why aren't the women stepping up to be those power speakers or to be uh, the senior leaders? And one of the key problems is that because of gender stereotypes and biases against women, what happens is that women can raise their hands all they want, but they don't get picked. One of the things oh. that... One of the the things that we talk to corporations about, groups about, is that when men are invited to be on panels, they really need to look around and see who else is going to be on that panel. And we think that it's very appropriate for men to say it looks like it's going to be an all-male panel in an area in which they know there are talented women, to just say, no thanks, not unless you're going to bring on some women to be on that panel with me. We're not going to just have men talking to this group. Hmm. We need a balanced group. Maybe that's something that maybe that's something that I can do and have some other fellow speakers start doing that. You know, like if we're on a panel, like I, thought, I see there's a lot of guys here. Why don't we get some women in here? And you know, I think it's I think it's a great idea. I think that's what Every we should be doing. Every little bit helps, frankly. Yeah. Oh no, I agree. I 100% agree. So, so Al, what is your big why for what you do? Well, I started along with a couple of other guys a law firm back a long time ago, and mm-hmm. we thought we were just about 
the cat's meow. That we good. He there was. That's how long ago the hit firm started. Huh? <laughs> Uh, uh, was, and it begins. Yes, the dynamic. <laughs> we, we were fair. We were uh, inclusive. We were right. going to be absolutely perfect. We were a meritocracy, if there ever was one. And about right. 30 years, 40 years later, I looked around and I said, where are the women leaders in this world? If we were so great, if we were doing everything just right, why don't we have any more women leaders than any of these other places that I know are filled with gender bias? And so I started looking at myself, at my partners, and realized that so much of what was happening was unconscious, was implicit, was assumptions that we were not even aware of. It had to do with practices, policies that we were implementing that were favoring men over women. And from that time on, I said, I'm going to do something about this. I'm not going to let this happen. Hmm. Outstanding. I like that a lot. So what do you think was the transformational moment that put you both on the path to what you're doing today? Well, for me, um, I started my, my legal practice at Al's law firm a million years ago, and um, <laughs> uh, they couldn't have cared if you were purple polka dotted. If you did a good job, everybody wanted you on their projects. Good. And so for me, I started my, my practice that way, and then – I joined a much larger organization where people don't know you. They don't know what you bring to the table. And so the consequence was, well, she's a woman, so she obviously can't be talented. Or how could she have a corner office? And how could she have all these clients? That must mean that she's evil, nasty, and I don't want to work with her. And so I was um, put on our um, I was voted onto our management committee and then our compensation committee. And my sort of aha, I can't believe this transformational moment was when I started to read the self evaluations that were written by the lo- other lawyers. And 1,100 lawyers, there's a lot of self evaluations. And what yeah. I could tell almost immediately was which ones were written by women and which, which ones were written by men. Because the women would write about, I was on the ABC team, and the team consisted of so-and-so and and -and so-and-so and -and so-and-so, and, you know, we saved the clients the money. And the self-evaluations written by the men were, I'm a total rock star, I climbed to the top of the Empire State Building, I circled around, saw that I could rescue rescue 19 damsels in distress if I went down the left (laughs) face, So I went down that way, I rescued all of them, and I single-handedly saved the client half a billion dollars. Well, who do you think was making more money? Right. And that was really my transformational moment. That's So that's when I started writing and talking about what women needed to do in order to communicate in ways that would allow them to advance in gender-biased workplaces. Wow. That's, yeah, well, I guess we're the the egotistical, (laughs) or is it just lawyers? Is it men in general? Is it like lawyers? Is that kind of the the industry standard? It it cuts across um, self-evaluations written by men and women. um, Oh, okay. They're all going to look like that because women are socialized to believe that we're supposed to be kind and nice and sweet and modest. Mm -hmm. And we grow up where we're told, don't get your dress dirty, don't tear your tights. And young boys are encouraged to say what they want and speak what they believe, and boys be boys. And so it creates a a dichotomy that um, is not just carried through through childhood, but also into into our work lives. Got it. All right. Al, what about you? What was your transformational moment? What put you on the path to this? 
Well, <clears throat> I've already mentioned the that revelation that I realized that we were not doing any better than anybody else. And but my transformational moment was to look around at the men and realize <clears throat> that men were not getting it. That men were not realizing how much tougher it was for women and why, and that it really needed uh, a little bit of a profit out to the male audience as opposed to just to the female audience. If you look around at whether it's law firms or corporations, at the gender diversity committees that are being set up in virtually all businesses, who do you see on those committees? You just see women, or you see people of color, and you don't see mm -hmm. white men at, who are in positions of power. So my transformational moment was the recognition that you need to start speaking to the men who are controlling the economic engines of our country. They're the ones that need to get this. Hmm. So that last part, one more time, that was pretty important. It was that we need to enlist the male power structure in the diversity yeah. effort. We need to get uh, men 100%. excited yeah. about this issue. Too many men think that gender diversity is about a zero-sum game, that if we pick the women up, if we give the women opportunities, it just means that the men – are going to be disadvantaged, that they won't have as much opportunity as they have now. Well, that's just not true. When women right. are given fair right. chances, everybody does better. The business does better. The business is more creative and innovative, and it makes more yep. money. Everybody comes out ahead. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. So what have you both done to – to elevate the world around you. We talked about you guys are speakers, uh, your, your book, Breaking Through Bias, Communication Techniques for Women to Succeed at Work. So what, what do you all do on a daily basis, or what is your mission to elevate this to the, to the proper level? Well, well, one of the things is um, information becomes important. Information's power. Mm -hmm. And that's really sort of one of the things we do is we try to get the word out. Uh, but the other part of it is that, um, as Al said, it's not just women talking to ourselves. Women talk about these issues all the time. And uh, if we just talk to ourselves, nothing's going to change. And so what we really try to do is we try to reach – um, diverse audiences, audiences of women and men. We try to work with senior leaders because what we mm -hmm. do in our book, for example, is we talk to women as to what they can do in gender-biased workplaces to get ahead. That's really one of the trains that's leaving the station. There's also the, what organizations need to do and what men need to do. So there's really mm -hmm. three different trains, and we try to do what we can to make sure that all three of those trains are being, um, you know, fairly uh, loaded up with uh, women and men. So we're, you know, along the lines that Andy's talking about, we are out mm -hmm. probably once a week. We're writing blogs uh, in addition to this book that you've mentioned uh, breaking Through Bias, we have a new book uh, that is now at the publisher and will be released the end of August called It's Not You, It's the Workplace. Women's Conflict and the Bias that Built It. So that what mm. we're trying to do is elevate this conversation to extend it, to make it clear that women's concerns about their relationship with other women aren't because there's something fundamentally wrong with them, but because they're right. working in workplaces in which bias is so pervasive. So we, we spoke this morning, as a matter of fact, to a group of uh, intellectual property uh, specialists, and uh, uh, we tried to talk to them about precisely these issues. 
interestingly, uh, the evaluations came back. There were about 200 people on the conference. Uh, virtually all of the women gave us fours and fives, uh, and about five men gave us ones. <laughs> uh-huh. Five is good, one is bad. <laughs> so that it's best we talk to the man about the problems and otherwise – there's still men out there that are very hostile to this whole idea. Yeah, I was going to say, how receptive was that? <laughs> well, there were a lot more men than just those five, but uh, uh, you notice when you get a one. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I would, I would say so. Wow. So, moving forward, what is what is the ultimate goal? I know that this, I mean, it's going to take a lot of work. I understand that um, it's not something that's going to be, you know, you can't build Rome in a day type thing. But what's what's the goal? What's the plan? How do you how do you bridge the gap? Well, one of the things that we um, uh, that we've put together, which we've uh, laid out in our in our second book of "It's Not You, It's the Workplace," is really a, a seven step program for what organizations can do. And in addition to the sorts of things that women need to do on their own. Um, And for example, uh, what we find is that information is the starting point. Uh, Talking with you and your listeners about these issues, that's an important step forward. Uh, But that's not gonna be enough. And so uh, we have to, when, when there are career Um, uh, when there are evaluations or considerations that affect somebody's career advancement, you have to eliminate the discretion from the process so that somebody Mm -hmm. can't say something like, well, she's not a self-starter or um, I don't really think she has what it takes. Instead, they have to evaluate her on her core competencies how does she right. do the work? How does she accomplish what she's asked to do? Um, another one of the, the seven is uh, we play off of the uh, symphony blind audition process. And many of your listeners may not be aware, but in the United States in the 1970s, there were very few women or people of color on the mm-hmm. major symphony orchestras. And what the what they started to do was do auditions behind a screen so that the judges could not tell whether it was a man or a woman or a white mm. person or a pur- purple polka dotted person playing the instrument. Right. And in fact, the women would take their shoes off to walk across the stage so that they wouldn't give away who was the going to get that instrument. And we now have about 50-50 in our um, orchestras. So it's hard in many situations to evaluate people b- behind a screen, but there are some techniques that can be used along that. Um, you know, right. want to talk about a few more of those? Or? Well, um, to, to, to emphasize, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the goal here? The goal is to try to um, play missionary to as many organizations and businesses and people as we can. We're only two people. We're writing, though. A mm-hmm. lot of people are reading what we're writing. We get Good. mostly very positive feedback. And the hope is uh, that little by little, we can make a difference. Uh, you can't go to bed at night and think you can't make a difference. We believe we can. Right. Yep. I agree. Yeah. You know, you know I just, I don't know. I can't believe in 2019 we're still talking about this. Yeah. You know? Like, like well, I've spent the last are, eight years in the military. Why are we still talking about sexual harassment in 2019? How That's can true. it be yeah. that, You're right. that that yeah. this is a major problem? We just, mm-hmm. was just working on a survey before this call started that showed that over 80%, over 80%, of women have experienced some form of unwelcome sexual uh, advancement uh, yes. in their lives. And I have done that, that. I have, I have done, I have covered this on the show about women in the workplace, sexual harassment, 
um, sexual assaults and how to get over that. And, and uh, I have covered that, but I literally haven't covered this, the gender bias, which, which, well, what would, it, thing, which is a great compliment to the, to what, well, you know, it, to the sexual assaults. It is because they actually are tied together. So yes, that, 100%. Um, an article in the Harvard Business Review um, about if you want to know what your employees think about um, harassment, you should ask them. And basically the studies show that organizations that, in, that um, allow for gender bias have more um, harassment problems than those that don't. And organizations that um, uh, it, it allow people to be uncivil to each other uh, have mm-hmm. more harassment than other organizations. So it's really a con- spectrum, a continuum of behaviors that all lead up to what could be ultimately an assault. Wow. Hey, you know, that's, that's very true. The gender bias, I mean, if you if you respect and I'm just kind of spitballing here. If you respect the woman, her intellect, what she brings to the table on your team, um, her contributions, who she is as a person, and how she is on, you know, like all around, um, you know, you, you wouldn't do that to her. You wouldn't, you know, sexually harass her or even assault her. That's why we hit it so hard inside the military. Like, why are we having these issues in the military? Are we not valuing the woman? Like, just a couple of years ago, we had this whole thing about women in combat. Oh, women don't belong in combat. Women And women fought to be in combat. Guess what? They're in combat now. I was like, right. why wouldn't you have a woman in combat? Why would she, she be treated any differently? Oh, because she's not as strong as a man. She can't run as fast as a man. She got like, I, look, I know some amazing women that are serving in the military that would put some men to shame. <laughs> Like I know some really CrossFit strong women who who run five and ten Ks that would put some men to shame. So don't go thinking that a woman is 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 you know not superior or maybe inferior to a man. Like that's a bunch of crap. And especially with you know the regiment that we have in the military, that's ridiculous. Have we lost you? So yeah, women women serve in the military just as just as the same as men now. Women are in combat, the whole thing. So. I'm, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna respond to that because that's absolutely true. Uh, when our first book came out, we got uh, comments from uh, uh, men and women who had been in the Marines, both. Um, uh, currently at that time or were retired from the Marines. And um, one of the most interesting comments we got was from a fellow who um, was currently a um, lieutenant in a major fire, uh, fire department in a, in a big city. And he said yep. that what he had, what, what struck him the most was that um, one of the ways that gender bias plays out is in, um, treating women as if they're somehow um, uh, more delicate or that yes. they really do what it takes. And that we, that's referred to as benevolent bias. That women are given special breaks, special privileges, less yep. less rigorous training, less uh, arduous mm-hmm. assignments. And so what I've the fellow that. said was, I realize now that I – went out of my way to try to, quote, help these women um, because I didn't want them to think that I was a sexist pig when in reality I wasn't giving them the same opportunities that I was giving to the men under me. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, uh, I was a drill instructor for Air Force basic training, and uh, I'll tell you, I loved having, having female flights because they march so much better they're disciplined. They're a little bit smarter. Um, but the one thing about them is when they hold a grudge or, or you lose loyalty with them, it is so hard for them to follow you. And so if you treat them, if you mistreat them, um, if, you're, if you're in a training situation and you mistreat them, uh, they, 
They don't they don't care what you have to say after that. You've lost them. You've lost their loyalty. They're done. They will they will not follow you. Men are a little bit different. Men are a little bit dumber where we just follow anybody with, with some rank and structure and go, yes, sir. <laughs> like, okay. The open know. elephant never forgets, huh? Yeah, pretty much. You know, and I've had, I've had women tell me before. You know, so I remember this one time uh, we were in the dining facility, and, uh, and one of the instructors were picking on one of my girls. And I was like, if you ever mess with my females again, you and I are going to go out back, and we're, and we're going to handle this. Like men. Right, I bet you so, that those women would have been happy to take them out back too. Right. Oh well, when we got upstairs, um, you know, we were, we were doing our stuff, we were doing our training, whatever, and then we were on a break, and uh, and I remember I I brought them into the into the these big bays, you know, I brought uh-huh. them into the bay next to next to the beds. Okay, we're gonna make our beds, you know, we're gonna I'm gonna teach you this one thing, I'm gonna get you this straight, you know, whatever, and you know the the the, the one in charge, uh, the dorm chief, called dorm chief. Well, she, she was in charge, and she goes, sir, you know, may I speak freely? I was like, you're on a thin rope. She goes, sir, we saw what you did in the dining facility. We appreciate that. That's all we knew. That's all, that's all we were looking for. We want someone to have our back. And I was like, really? And so I spent a couple of minutes explaining to him. I was like, well, I would do that for, for you as I would the men. Like, I don't want people just messing with my, with my trainees. Those are, that's my flight. It's my trainees. Leave them alone. Right. You know, and some instructors, they want to, they want to, you know, show off their masculinity and look what I can make you do because you have to follow it. You know, it's that, right, right, that right. It's, a, it's a complex and some inferior and complex or something. And she's like, no, sir, we, we just appreciate your loyalty. I'm like, I got your back. Like, no matter what, I got your six in and out of the field. I got you. And after that, they were loyal. I mean, anything I needed, I'm like, hey, I need you guys to, to step it up. Or I need you guys, hey, you know, and then I'd reward them. And then, and, and so we, we had each other's backs and we knew that we had each other's backs. And I was like, this is what it should be. It should be, Absolutely. well, they're girls, so let's just make it easy on them. We'll just make it easy on them. Because I was not, if anything, I was harder on them, you know, because I knew what they were capable of. And I'll tell you, out of four female flights, out of the 10 flights I had in basic training, I had four female flights and three out of the four. Um, got almost every award that you could get in basic training. Three out of the four almost got every single award. They were the, they were the best fights I've ever had. Wow, cool. I think it's interesting that you say, you know, the military has done so much. One of the reasons the military, I think, has been able to accomplish that is that it's a command-driven structure. The top yes. can say, we're going to do it this way. This is yes. going to be the policy. We're going to treat women this way. And anybody who doesn't is out of line and is going to be uh, pulled back into line. So that there is discipline up and down the line. Unfortunately, in business, in the profession, we don't have that kind of command structure. And it's much harder to get the man to accept the program, to accept the objective, to get on board with this notion that what we're looking for is not the superiority of men, it's not the superiority of women, it's the equality of both. I'd agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with that. The superiority of, yeah, because there isn't any of that in in the military. I mean, there is, I mean, you know how there was oh, zero tolerance. Zero to, when I say there's a zero tolerance, I mean they're spending, the military is spending a ton of money on what's called the green dot program to combat the sexual assaults and sexual harassment that goes on. If it does, right. The, the military is spending a ton of money on resilience programs for men and women to become more resilient in their day-to-day activities. The military is spending a ton of money on inclusion and diversity programs. This is, this is a hot topic. For the military, ever since I mean, it was like two, three years ago. Actually, I think it was like two years ago when the I think it was the Marines, either the Marines or the Army, had a huge article out in like the you know the Army Times or the or the Stars and Stripes, one you know one of the military mm-hmm. uh, newspapers, and they said like women inequality and they bring this up and like should women go to combat? Should they not? Are they in effect? You know whatever? And they determined that nope, they're equal. They're the same. Well, the Marines yeah, were okay, the slowest. 
their act together about that, but uh, I believe they've yes. figured it out now. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I know for a fact that since I've been in the Air Force, which was 2001, as a matter of fact, in 2003, when we deployed during the, the, the Iraq invasion, I was partnered with women, like Air Force women, like we were doing the same job. Like there wasn't, you know, and, and maybe it was a little bit, I mean, we weren't in combat. Like I wasn't like storming into buildings, but I was still deployed doing the jobs that needed to be done. You know, we were still loading aircraft. We we're still, you know, downrange. We were still, you know, there. Like we did the same things, you know. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't know what what all that stemmed from. Uh, you know, with the with the Marines and everything else. But I'm glad that it all got settled because I I know some amazing women that I've served with that I mean that were stellar at what they did, and we were all a better team because of them. Glad to hear it because that's what that's what our sense has been as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, do you guys rely on stats a lot? I wonder. Oh yes. Um, if you look at our book and particularly in the second book, we're we're very data driven. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I'm a very. The world according to us is wonderful, except that if the world according to us is just what we think, it's not gonna, it's not gonna sway anybody. So, there's we've done uh, oh, our yeah. own original research. We've um, uh, researched um, all of the social science literature. Um, mm. All of the done some surveys on our own, and um, so uh, we are very data driven. Good. Yeah, I the one thing that really gets to me is is the misinformation though, right? We I mean, we're talking a lot about I mean, I just pulled up some some stats earlier today and it was, you know, for every 80 cents that a woman makes, the man's making a dollar, which I mean, I don't believe that at all uh that that should take place. I do believe it is happening, but I believe that it should not happen. Right? Right. Well, we so, we're, we're in agreement. <laughs> yeah. So, so the other side of the coin, right? Is I wonder how much misinformation. I wonder in the work center if I'm a corporation, let's say I'm Apple, and I've got women who are coders and I've got men who are coders. I wonder because they have to report the income levels and everything. I wonder if I'm misrepresenting the income levels in my corporation. If I'm a CFO or if I – I wonder if that takes place. That's kind of what, what I'm thinking about right now. I'm wondering where the data comes from and if it's being misrepresented. Like I don't really want to tell the world that I don't pay my women the same as men, and you know, so I'm going to misrepresent and you know, misquote or whatever. Well, we're not aware that anyone is consciously misrepresenting data. What we That's are good. aware of, however, is that there's – that corporations are not doing a very good job of collecting that data. Uh, you mentioned uh. Apple, but most corporations don't have any idea that they are paying their women less than their men because they don't compile that data that way. They, don't, they aren't set up to say one of the important values of our organization is going to be gender pay parity. It's going to be gender assignment parity. It's going to be gender promotion parity. And so they don't collect the data in a way that would expose their con their inequality. One of the mm. things that we talk about that is now a prominent uh, concern is to try to get corporations to reveal this, the New York State. They, they kick and scream and fight about doing that. Yeah, in, in okay. New York State, as they have a law under consideration that would force businesses, I'm not sure the size, over 100 maybe, to dis publicly disclose their pay levels at various um, positions. So we're, we've got a long way to go to really get at uh, the the data that we need to make it clear that Corporation X and Corporation Y are 
uh, discriminating against women with respect to pay, about discriminating with respect to uh, uh, opportunities and uh, mm-hmm. promotion. So I don't, I, we don't see the misrepresentation so much as we don't, as we see the unavailability of the right kind of information, or the reluctance to share it when they know what the information is. Right. Got it. Now then, okay. Yeah, I was just thinking. I'm like, man, we're so because we are. We're so data driven, and I, I'm hugely data driven. You know, if it's a fact, if it's a statistic, if it's you know whatever, then to me, I'm like, that's that's it. That's stone. That's you know whatever. But the problem is that where's that data coming from? You know, how misconstrued is that data? And so we're basing these decisions that we make off of maybe faulty, faulty data that maybe the pay gap is bigger than what we think or could be smaller than what we think. And so every time I think about, you know, where's this data coming from and how do I know and what, uh, sometimes I'll just research the person who's done it. You know, mm-hmm. if there's like, um, if there's like a certain company that made the statistic, I'm like, cool, let's see the research. Cause it's all public knowledge anyways. And I find that some of them are, or actually I'd say most of them are pretty much right on point. Like I don't, like you said, I don't think anybody is like, well, we got to misconstrue these blur the lines a little bit. We can't really, you know, but I also don't think that somebody doesn't want to tell on themselves either. <laughs> like, Oh yeah. Well, well, totally they, don't, do. like, just <laughs> assume, they just assume not report the data if they believe that it's not yep. going to be attractive to them. Well, right. you see that you said you've, You've talked about sexual harassment. You see that colleges don't want to report their sexual harassment uh, or sexual assault situations, and they've been forced to do so, and only reluctantly. Businesses don't want to report that information. They don't want to embarrass themselves. The same is true for this pay disparity. The same is true for the number of female managers or executives that they have. Those are statistics... Make businesses look bad, and they just assume look good. Yep. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. Uh, maybe why would <laughs> why didn't anybody want to voluntarily, you know, uh, report that stuff? So, so what do we? So what do we do? It's everybody. I, I think it's always everybody's responsibility. I mean, you can't fight, you know, the you can't you can't fight the world, but individually we're a lot stronger. So, what do we got to do? Where do you see us uh, going in the next year, five years? Well, one of the things is that um, there are concerted efforts to make sure that this data is getting collected. Um, Mm -hmm. There's uh, requirements that uh, companies above a certain size, as Al said in New York, that's a a pending litigation, but a pending legislation, but in Europe – uh, major companies are required to report the pay gap between women and men, and uh, it's uh, pretty staggering. Um, you know, so that goes into the first point that I made about information being powerful, uh, even mm-hmm. if it's not information that you want necessarily um, other people to see about your company or your organization. I think the other thing as to, you know, this, the notion of moving this needle <coughs> The business community really needs to be convinced uh, that they're going to do a better job if they're diverse. I think that the military has learned that they can be a more effective, uh, more thoughtful, more creative uh, group if they are if they treat men and women equally. Well, I think businesses could think that they will be better. They'll make more money. They'll innovate. They'll serve their customers better if, in fact, they will achieve the kind of diversity that uh, the women deserve, the people of color deserve. And Mm -hmm. we need to find ways to convince the business community that it's in their selfish interest to get on board with this program. Right. I agree with you 100%. So how do we get your books? And um, and how do we learn more about your mission? Well, uh, you you introduced our website at the very beginning. It's Andy A N D I E and Al dot com. Uh, 
information about our books are there. Uh, you can order them uh, right there, or you can go to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or your local bookstore. Uh, the new book is available for pre-order now and will be published the end of August. And what's the new book called? It's not you, it's the workplace, women's conflict at work, and the bias that built it. Wow. Wow, that title is powerful. Wow. It's, and everything's uh, available on Amazon, is that right? Yes, exactly, exactly. Good. As we, as we say, the world is available on Amazon. And, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, so as we wrap up, I want to give you all an opportunity to give a nugget of knowledge. What would be the one thing, Andy, we'll start with you. What is the one thing that you want the listeners to know and or to do about what we've talked about here today? Well, I want them to know that even small steps forward can make a difference and that every one of us, instead of throwing up our hands and saying, this is too complicated, I'm never going to be able to solve it, should know that little tiny steps forward can go a long way. Um, that would really right. be the first thing. And the other thing is that, at least for the women who are listening, um, it can be very discouraging. And one of the things that I would say to all the women is to – realize that the very resilience that you you were talking about in the context of the military training goes a long way in in the workplace as well and having a, a, a sense of humor about things that are um, outrageous or offensive uh, can also help you uh, move forward so I would say don't give up the fight Got it. Al, same question. What do you want the listeners to know and or to do? Well, what I'd like them to know is that there's no such thing as a person that doesn't have biases. We all do. They are unconscious. They're reflexive. They are automatic. And we're not going to get rid of them by just telling ourselves not to be biased. So I'd like people to realize that they're not perfect. They're not bias-free, and they need to be alert to that fact, and they need to be certain that they are employing techniques that make them aware of those biases and that then interrupt the operation of those biases when they are making decisions that affect other people's careers. That's powerful. Wow. I'm so glad we got to do this today. I've learned um, a lot, some things to really kind of take away. You know, if, uh, if my entrepreneur career after the military takes off and I end up building a multi-million dollar business, which is my hope, and I employ people, you know, this is something that, that I'm going to really, it's going to stick with me. You know, and if uh, if my kids, you know, I've got daughters, I've got sons. So, you know, when they're employed at different places, you know, these are the things that I need to tell them about, you know, like this is what happens. You know, it's unfair, but I hate the gesture that, well, it's just the way it is. It's just the way we've always done it. I cannot well, it's time stand to break that. that too. You're right. Well, we we'll leave with the hope that you build that multi-billion dollar corporation and that you build a gender diverse workplace and help with the change that we're all working to achieve. Absolutely. That's going to be my plan. A lot of right now, as we start to close the show, uh, I want to get your thought on this. What we see right now, is it, a lot of speakers um, that are getting booked are inclusion and diversity and social responsibility in a company. Does this fall in that, what you guys are, are, are doing with your mission? Is that what this falls into? Is it a social responsibility? And is it the inclusion and diversity that we keep talking about? It's clearly diversity and inclusion. Very often social responsibility reflects on 
you know, community service and things like mm-hmm. that. Um, but mm-hmm. it uh, could theoretically fall into that bucket as well. Sure. I like it. Andy and Al, it has been an absolute honor and absolute pleasure to have you on Life Transformation Radio. And I'm excited. I think this, this episode and the message within it um, is going to reach the right people. I don't think it's a happenstance that, you know, that this show about transformation has this sort of topic on here. And the people that are listening have, if this is your first time listening, it's not a coincidence that you stumbled upon this one topic of the gender inequality with pay and everything else that, that we see inside the workplace. So Andy and Al, thank you so much for being an amazing guest on Life Transformation Radio. Thank you for having us. We've enjoyed it. We very much appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. As, and where should everybody go to to learn more about you? A website, Facebook, LinkedIn, where do you want them to go? Well, the best place is to go to our website, andyandal.com, A-N-D-I-E-A-N-D-A-L.com, because there we have information about our blogs, we have information about our speaking, we have uh, surveys and assessments and um, uh, other things that would be useful to um, advance the conversation. And we would love for people to uh, join the discussion and sign up for our newsletter. Uh, if they go to that website, they can. They have questions. If they have comments, they can uh, right there. They can email us, and we'll respond promptly. I love it. Thank you so much again for your time and um, and the information that you've shared with us today. Thank you so much. Bye now. Life Transformation Radio listeners, if anything resonated with you today during this episode, please connect with Andy and L. They are on a mission and a mission so deserving of our attention. If anything resonated with you, connect with them at their website and all of their social media links. Everything is in the show notes of this episode. If you want to book them to come and speak to your organization or come and speak to your event, go to their website, send them an email. Get in touch with them. They are amazing at what they do. And with that, I want to leave you with this. Live your brand. Find opportunities every day to live out the core values that you hold deep in your heart. And I call this living your brand. So until next episode, live a great life.